and then we want to play a video now of a comment by a gentleman. I'm sure a few people probably picked this up on their phones or saw it on the media. The truth I'm telling you now is not about sentiment. Is that there are a group of people in this country that feels that this country should be Islamized. This is a fact. I said you want me to start mentioning names of people in this government that we have interrogated. I was a member of an interrogation team. And I've interrogated a very high-ranking member of this government in 2007-2008 on issue of Boko Haram. I interrogated him. He's in this government right now. And what was the issue? Boko Haram. And this senior officer was actually let go because it, it, he was found culpable. But right now he's in the government. You see, we must say the truth, because if you don't, this country is going down the precipice. We have been set back more than 60 years right now. We've gone back to the time before 1966 now. And whoever is coming back to repair this country has a lot of work to do. This country has never been polarized, so we cannot run away from it. We have never been this much polarized. I'm a federal person. My mind is federal. My brain is federal. My loyalty is federal. I kill, I do things for the federal government. So I cannot come here and try to be sentimental. No. I'm a federal person. So will your life be at risk now that they're hearing I, you? I don't care. I don't care. And um, my colleagues, they know me. Those people that are listening to me, they know me. I don't care. The issue is that this country is bigger than an individual. That is the issue. This country is bigger than individuals. But why do we come and go? Uh, eliminating me or killing me will not solve the problem. And will not add value. But he will come and go. And somebody must come and repair the damage to the psyche of this society, the damage to the polarization, to the nepotism that I've never seen in my life. I work with all these presidents. This is the worst situation I've found myself. No, that's Commodore Kunle. Allow me retired. I think he spoke on the press I'm not last week or so. Um, do you have any comments? He was looking specifically at uh, security. NDA gets attacked. We have Sanusi talking about uh, issues of the economy. What are your thoughts? And uh, he says Nigeria is polarized and he's never seen it that bad before. I don't know if you have any comments on that. And if indeed he's correct, what do we need to do to begin to put Humpty Dumpty together again? Well, I don't know whether we can put Humpty Dumpty together again. I would hope so. But it will also depend whether Humpty Dumpty himself wants to be put back together again. Uh, I salute his courage. I, I really salute his courage. He's a patriot. Clearly, anybody who has worked in the second profession, profession of intelligence. Uh, they are not rabble rousers. They are not given to flippancy. They are not people, once you're in intelligence, the one thing you do is you have surrendered any idea of faith. You will be seen and you will not be heard. For him to come out and speak, it means he has seen something that most Nigerians haven't seen. You know, Senior Pastor, it was around about this time last year that I gave an interview to a small FM radio that I thought was innocuous and you know, obscure little FM radio somewhere in Badagri. 
Uh, it was early in the morning around 7.30. I was having my coffee while having a chat with them. And before I knew the whole thing spread around the whole world. And, uh, you know, it was like all hell had broken loose. Uh, and even as I speak to you, uh, I still don't consider myself a free person. I'm not staying in my house. I'm not staying with my family. I'm staying somewhere far from home because uh, my life has been in danger. It's serious danger, in fact. Uh, so for simply speaking out in the same way, and coming from a professional and as an insider, I think um, has kind of vindicated where what some of us had been crying about for, for a long time, that there's a lot of shenanigans in high places. There's a kind of collusive attitude with regard to insecurity in our country, and that a lot of people know more than they're prepared to acknowledge, and that we are being taken for a big right. We're sacrificing young people. Huge fortunes have been spent. Recently, we are told that over the years, the defense budget has been more than a trillion far, far in excess of education, which in my view should be number one, you know. And so there is a kind of game theoretic interest among those who have invested so much, quote unquote, in the insecurity business. They don't want it to end. It's a source of wealth. It's a source of power. And it's a source of imposing fear and control over other people. You know, the devil walks through the instrumentality of fear. And the greatest enemy of the devil is anybody who shows that he's not afraid of him. I've told them I'm not afraid of you because you can only kill the, the, the physical flesh. You can't, keep, you can't kill the spirit. So I'm not scared of you at all. He said that for the sake of my family, I must find somewhere to stay so that I can live and look after them. I have a very, very sick child. He's been very, very sick. A very bright young man. And for him and his siblings and his, his mother, I must keep myself alive. Uh, so I salute the courage of Commodore Kunle Ulaumi. I think he's a patriot. I think he has spoken truth to power. And instead of uh, going about their reflex action, uh, they should do some soul searching and examine what he's saying in order to find practical solutions that work for everyone, uh, you know, and this thing is coming at the wake of the attack on the NDA that you mentioned. Uh, it is a tragedy, it is terrible. But then, you know, senior pastor, for several years, we were told that that area, and Kaduna is my home state, by the way, that that area between Rigasa, that's the, the, the new railway station, right through that path through NDA, you know, uh, that some of these crazy characters used to stay there. So apparently people knew them, that they were there. You know, not a few months ago, they nearly killed the Honorable Minister of uh, Transport. The Honorable Amechi, he went to Kaduna, I think for some event, and he fled for his dear life. He was nearly killed by these so-called bandits. And, you know, believe in me, senior pastor, any time I hear the name bandit, whoever pronounces it, I associate him with the killers as well, because bandits don't attack military installations. Bandits don't bring, back, bring down air jet fighters. It is terrorists who do. And by calling them bandits, we are literally and consciously identifying and justifying their wicked and diabolical actions. They are not bandits. They are terrorists. They are evil terrorists who deserve no sympathy, who deserve no human rights, who must be brought to book. They have killed, they have made, they have raped, they have committed atrocities on a staggering scale. 
the UN a few weeks ago came out through UNICEF to announce that about 345,000 children, <laughs> children have been killed in the Northeast over the last 12 years. Now, it didn't stop there. Two days ago, Governor Zulum announced that more than 450,000 Northeast people have gone missing. Nobody knows where they are. Their parents don't know where they are. Their families don't know where they are. So if people have been missing for several years, you can, three years is the legal you know, thing. You can, you can consider them dead from a legal point of view. So we are talking about, if in the Northeast alone, we are talking about 800,000 or 900,000. What do you think would be the figure for the Northwest the central, the middle belt, where these killings have been going on for almost 20 years. The truth is, the figure is probably more than a million of those who have died. And over three... Please unmute yourself, doctor. Oh, sorry. So, so you know, we're talking about a terrible catastrophe, probably a million people have died already in this wicked and evil human orchestrated, you know, humanitarian disaster that we're facing. And more than 3 million refugees, uh, plus many more. Uh, the damage, as the Commodore explained, is not only in physical and infrastructures, but also the psyche of Nigeria and a whole generation that have been traumatized by these wicked atrocities. You know, if Nigeria were a different country, if Nigeria were Ghana or South Africa, the world would have, you know, risen up in arms already. But because it is Nigeria, and because I suspect some world powers actually have a vested interest in Nigeria collapsing, uh, they are quiet. It's a massive silence on what is happening, but it is a, a serious humanitarian uh, tragedy. I'm going to ask you two questions, sir. And uh, it's part of what you have said that has led me to ask these questions. Number one, who are the people in your own idea that are behind this killings? Who are the people and what do they stand to gain? Second question, why does government seem almost unable to do something about it? And third question, these world powers that we always seem to tend to want to run to all the time, asking for aid, asking for help, asking for this, asking for even structure and strategy to get us out of where we are. Are they really interested in this? And you said this silence tells you that world powers want Nigeria to fail. So in fact, they want Africa to fail. That's my own theory. And they never designed Nigeria to succeed in the first place. They created a Nigeria that they knew eventually we will find ourselves here. Even there's some theory that is saying that some of the coups that were instigated definitely had their hand and their backing in it. And um, a few other comments like that. What, 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 what are you thinking, sir? Well, actually, maybe I should start with the last question, uh, Senior Pastor, about these world powers. You know, I don't know whether you, the last interview that Masad and Kanu uh, Alhaji Sule, uh, what is his other name? Uh, Magadim, the Muslim in Kanu, who was a permanent secretary, permanent representative to the UN, and a minister in the world's government. He said that he and Shagari, during the Civil War, were sent abroad as goodwill ambassadors. Shagari was sent to the Nordic countries. 
And one of, uh, as Shagarib became president later, as you know, uh, one of the senior politicians in one of the Scandinavian countries, Sir Shagarib, and said, look, we know why you've come here. You need our help to solve your civil war problem. I tell you, not only are we going to help you, if I, we have a way of adding to your headache, we are going to do it. We know you Nigerians. They are very smart people. They are very hardworking people. In fact, we know the natural resources on your earth. We know them even more than you. We don't even know some of them. Half, you don't know half, half what we know about your natural resources. We don't want competition. We don't want any Japan in Africa. We don't want you to develop so that you can now use those natural resources to develop your own country. And then we shall lose our markets. You are our traditional markets. You are the place where we all dump our goods. So if you become an advanced industrial technological state, which we are sure you will be, if left on your own, if left with just 20 years of peace, nobody knows how great Nigeria will be. That's what the man said. So in fact, after the civil war, we are going to always find problems to add to your headache. We will never allow you to develop peacefully because we know the day Nigeria rises, we've lost Africa forever. Shagari thanked this man, thanked him for his honesty and his sincerity. So look at it, sir. After civil war, they will bring something like metatine. After metatine, they will bring things like religious crisis. After a religious crisis, there will be something like Ebola. After the AIDS, then Ebola, COVID. After Boko Haram, 10 years of Boko Haram, then they say bandits. After bandits, they say there's now ISWAP. I studied in France. I have nothing against France. They gave me a fantastic scholarship. And I was educated at one of their Ivy League institutions. I thank France. Thank you. I've heard that France is one of the people sponsoring Islam. Mm. Because France regards Nigeria as its enemy in West Africa. Even never minding that. Uh, actually, you know, Macron, the young Macron in the, the 90s, he was an intern in the Nigerian embassy, in French embassy in, uh, he went to the same institution like I did, the Ecole Nationale d'Administration. He, he came for his internship in Nigeria. And uh, during weekends, he used to fly to Fela's shrine in, uh, in uh, Kalakuta Republic in Lagos. So he knows Nigeria in and out. But it is so sad for us to hear that France is one of the sponsors of Israel, a very deadly organization, very evil, very violent. If you go to WikiLeaks, I don't need to mention names because some of those names can put us in danger. Go to WikiLeaks. Some of the foreign intelligence agencies that are linked with Boko Haram, it will surprise you. Now, I have been a student of European diplomacy, right from classical times. We're talking about Greece, the Greek Athenians in the age of Thucydides and Herodotus, uh, the clash between Athens and Sparta uh, during the Peloponnesian Wars, down to Italy of the Renaissance of Lorenzo de' Medici, Niccolò Machiavelli and all those people right to the ends of the terrible wars, 30 years of civil war that ended in the peace treaty of Westphalia, right to the palace of power diplomacy, uh, up to our 20th century, the San Francisco treaties, the emergence of the UN, the Cold War, the age of unipolar American hegemony, which is age we do to live in. The world has been governed by greed, by the naked thirst for power, the lust for power, the arrogance of power, hubris. This is what has governed the world. It's not sentiment, it's no brother, it's no fraternity of nations. It is naked struggle for power and for natural resources and for influence. 
This is what has governed the world. And none of these world powers are ever comfortable seeing an abstract nation, particularly from Africa, that would arise and challenge their supremacy. For over 500 years, they've seen Africa as nothing but a source of raw materials and a dumping ground for their resources and a source of slave labor till today. A German told me, and I was warning him, look, you guys come and help us because if Nigeria implodes, you can't control the sea of immigrants. He said, don't scare me. We need those young, intelligent Nigerians. Our uh, labor shortages are very serious and we're not having enough children again. So our population is going down. We need very bright. So if Nigeria collapses, it's to our advantage. That's what he told me, very frankly. Nigeria's population in 30 years time will be over 400 million. Our population doubles every 30 years. It's a fact of demographic statistics. In 1960, at the time of our independence, our population was about 57 million, 56, 57 million. Add 30 years to that, that is 1990, our population was 100 million. Add 30 years to that, which is 2020, from 1990, 2020 is another 30 years. Our population is over 200 million. So in another 30 years, it will double to over 400 million. Ahead of the United States, ahead of most, most of all the European countries, uh, we shall be number three after India and China. With all our natural resources, with all the can-do spirit of our people, the creativity of our youth, the can-do spirit of the Nigerian people, nobody knows how great this country could be if only it was in the right hands. World powers are very scared of that, very, very scared. So they want Nigeria to kaput by all means. That's why they're silent. There's no other way to explain this ignoble silence, this unnatural silence. Now, why can't government do anything? You ask whether, why is it a government is unable? I would say they're both unable and unwilling. They're both unable and unwilling. So, you know, we can pick our choice, <laughs> either or, or in fact both. They are both unwilling and, and unable. Uh, that is my, because they have been deceived into believing that this thing is about Islam, it's about jihad. That's why the intelligentsia, the Northern Ariwa intelligentsia, they're very quiet. They are saying, well, you know, uh, these methods are a bit too drastic, uh, too violent, but at least they are fighting for Islam. So let's keep quiet. He's our man. Well, bad or good, he's our man. So we can't speak bad against our man. And uh, they've all been deceived into believing that genocide fulfills the purpose of God on earth for Nigeria. But it's a damnable lie from the peace of hell. Who are these people? Well, I can tell you maybe only 20% of them are Nigerians. 80% of them are not Nigerians. Those of us who speak the Hausa language, I've said this several times. When somebody opens their mouth, we know precisely where they come from. I understand how some Kanu, how some Sakpato, how some Sakatana, how some Dawara, how some Zazo. It's very different from the very raw Hausa that you hear from Niger, from Chad, from Mali. Those of us who understand the language know exactly that these people are not Nigerians. That is why they kill with such venom. They are, they are pitiless. They can use a sword and they've done it on pregnant women. They cut them out and bring out the babies and slaughter them. For the past three weeks, they've been committing genocide in Jaws. Around Miango, Rokuba, they killed 300 people at one night. So when the youth were on edge, they saw a strange bus coming and in front of the bus, there was uh, an ambulance. So they stopped them. They said that they are Yorubas and they just came from an uh, Islamic conference in Bauchi. 
and they are going back to Ondo. Then the youth ask them, ah, this is not the main road to Ondo. Why are you following a bush path if truly you are going to Ondo? They searched the ambulance, and lo and behold, they found the most frightening arsenal of weapons, of military-grade weapons that you can think of. Then, of course, there was a kafufle, and of course, it led to death. My name is Pailafia, and Obadiah, but Pailafia means a man of peace, and uh, Obadiah means servant of the Most High. Uh, my mom for giving me that, uh, bless her soul, she's late now. She gave me that Old Testament name, means servant of the Most High. I would never complain killing murders. Uh, the, the, the cheap propaganda that some people have used out of that incident is, is dangerous and equally evil. Uh, you know, they've forgotten the hundreds they've killed in that area. And when the youths have decided to defend themselves, then all hell has broken loose. So please, when you hear such stories, dig deeper and find out the truth of what is actually at stake. And it turns out none of these people were Yoruba. None of them were going to undo anything. They were full Fulani names. And they were coming there to kill, to maim, to rape, and to destroy. That is what they came for. That was the main purpose of their mission. And the youths just stopped them on their tracks. This is what happened. But till today, even as of yesterday, they are piling dead bodies and dumping them in the government house in Jaws because the killings have increased. All the Fulanis have mobilized from the surrounding uh, states and they are coming on a massive onslaught against the defenseless people of Plateau State. So this is where we are. Most of these people are not Nigerians. Of course, they are collaborating with Nigerians and they are committing genocide. And you know, if we don't rise up to defend our land, uh, you know, they will take over. You know that about it. Because they believe that Christians are always in the business of turning the other cheek. So they are using that to go on a rampage. And if you study the history of that kind of expansionism, that is the way it has worked. They must be stopped. In the name of God and in the name of humanity, this evil must be stopped. Thank you very much, Doctor. Um, let me ask you one more question before I throw the um, platform open. Many people want to ask you questions. I see Itemi Tari lifting up her hands. We will get to you, Itemi, very shortly. Um, what do we do in Nigeria? How do we solve our problem? What are the action points to take to transform this country? You know, one of my favorite theologians is Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German theologian who stood up to Adolf Hitler and paid for it with his life. He was hanged in April 1945. He was just a young man. He was just about uh, 36 or so. He was not yet married. He was engaged to be married, but he was already a world famous theologian. Came from a top aristocratic German family. And he said, if I saw a madman on a truck driving on the road full of school children trying to cross, it shall be my duty to stop that madman. The people driving the ship of Nigeria have become mad people. It must be our duty to stop the truck that they are heading to destroy so many of our people. How do we do it? I'm a man of peace. I don't believe in violence. I belong to the Martin, I belong to the Martin Luther King School of Thought. If all the Christians in Nigeria Decided that for one week we will stay at home and fast. Yeah, if we decided that this evil government must change its ways, that there must be a restructuring of this country, or would all of us, every single Christian, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we shall down our tools, we shall stay at home 
until there is an agreement for a constitutional conference that will restructure this country. This is an illegal constitution. It was done by stealth. It is based on a fraud. It starts with we the people. When you and I, sir, were never consulted. We don't know who wrote it. Some say it's Professor Yadudu, whoever that guy is. All kinds of people call themselves professors these days. But I've been written by the devil for all he can. But definitely you and I were not consulted. So it is not our constitution. We must have a new constitution and a new re-engineering of the federation in such a way that all this egregious and jurisprudential mischief will no longer exist. And we can have a true constitution that is based on the true will of the people of Nigeria, all of them together. So that's the first step. Of course, we should pray. Pray and fast for our country. The Bible enjoins us to pray for our leaders. I do that. Let's all continue to do that. But thirdly, every community has a right to self-defense. No, no, this business of turning the other cheek must end today. There is nothing in the Bible that says you should lie down. There's some, some idiots should come by stealth of night and kill your wife and rape your daughter eh? and humiliate you and take everything of yours and kidnap your nephews and cousins, humiliate them, enslave them, use them into forced marriages. There's nowhere in the Bible that says you should lie down and accept such a fate. Our constitution and our laws are very clear. They enshrine the right to self-defense as a fundamental right. It's a precept of the law of nations. International law prescribes that every community that faces an existential threat to its very survival has not only a duty, but has an obligation to take such steps as are necessary to defend themselves. It is also guaranteed by natural law and natural justice and by equity. So let's not miss what's about it. We must use everything available to defend our families, defend our churches, defend our communities. Nobody has a right to come and humiliate you and uh, you know, violate your family, violate your rights. And you are there watching because you say you are a Christian. I don't know what kind of Christian that is. This is the time to stand up and face these people and defeat them. This is really what I think we must do. And this is exactly what we are trying to achieve on this platform. Specific things that everyone can do to take back our society. Uh, you will not believe how deep the, the challenge is and how very, very um, uh, taken over or corrupted our institutions are. So it's going to take a lot of work. But Dr. Obadiah, over to you, please. You have four questions to speak to. Sure. Yes, thank you. I recorded all of them. Thank you so very much, uh, Senior Pastor. The first question came from Eite Mitaire. Uh, if I got your name correct, if I mis mispronounced it, forgive me. You asked, what is next uh, in relation to what we need to do um, to the sponsorship of Islamization program? To be honest with you, I'm not worried about any Islamization program. You know, it was uh, uh, his lordship, uh, John Cardinal, Cardinal Onayeka, who said, look, nobody is stopping Christian from Christianization of Nigeria. Uh, we shouldn't stop and we must not, we cannot stop anybody from Islamization. It's part of the, the dua, the da'a, 
is what they call them the da of, of Islam, to proselytize. Our issue is with genocide, ethnic cleansing, violent killings and destruction of churches, uh, discrimination against Christians and persecution of the church. This is what we are against. Not necessarily about Islamization. They can Islamize anybody for, for all I care. That is not the issue. So, but what is next? The point I'm making is that look, the day that Christians, all the Christians of this country, and there are a minimum of 100 million Christians. That is even a test because some people are boasting that they are now the majority because they, are, they have brought in millions of illegal immigrants, illegal aliens. They've issued them with the documents, right of state. And they are now working with a swagger that they are now the democratic majority. Somebody reminded me not long ago that they are the democratic majority now. And in a democracy, it is a game of numbers. So they are there to call the shots because they are now the permanent majority. I say, well, until we have a proper census, we wouldn't know who are the majority. And if you are including these aliens that you've brought, then it is a fraudulent majority and it cannot be regarded as legitimate. What will happen if all Christians in this country stayed at home for a week in protest against atrocities, against the persecution of the church, against social injustice, against nepotism, against all these kidnappings and rapes and uh, violent atrocities? What if we stayed at home for a whole week, fasting and praying and say, we are not moving an inch until this government listens to us. I will bring the whole country to a standstill. That will even be a test as to know who is the true majority. Why can't we do that? What are we waiting for? While that fasting takes place, nobody should touch anything beef. It is because of this cow that they are killing so many people. So for heaven's sake, for a week, let's not eat their meat. Let's not eat the cow. Let's stay at home in protest and let's submit our constitutional grievances to the powers that be. That no, we will not cooperate with you until you address and meet our demands. That this constitution is illegal. It, has, it is loaded with you know, uh, jurisprudential uh, innovations that have changed the constitutional compact that existed since 1914 amalgamation, which put, cobbled up Nigeria together as a secular open state, not an Islamic state. We do not and we will never belong to an Islamic state. You are hell bent on enforcing an Islamic state you are hell-bent on using illegal aliens to take over our ancestral homelands, contrary to our constitution, contrary to the social contract that we have entered with. So we are downing our tools for one week. Let's do that and see what, whether Nigeria will survive it or not. Let's do that for a whole week. Let's bring this country to its knees until our demands are met. We don't need to throw even a stone. Just stay at home and fast and pray and say you are not going to work. Close the markets, close everywhere, close the schools, keep our children at home. And see what will happen. And it is doable. I, I, unfortunately, Khan doesn't have the stamina to do such a thing. Please, please, could somebody mute themselves because we are talking two of us now. Please, somebody is talking. Mute yourself, please. Excuse me, somebody is talking.
Doctor, please unmute yourself. We muted everybody. Please unmute yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Then Anthony Ubebo, uh, what do we do between now and when PMB, PMB leaves power? No, I think it is the same thing. At various levels, let us continue the agitation. Civil disobedience has moral force, and it is our right. If all of us as genuine Christians, and if you're a genuine Christian, you can never hate a Muslim. I have no business hating anybody. But if our church and the future of Christianity is being undermined in this country. And you know it. You know it from your heart of hearts. And you are quiet. Then we as a church have a very big problem. We must stand up and be counted. If you are ashamed of Christ today, he will be ashamed of you in the last day. I spoke out. I stood up because of my Christian conscience. My conscience would not allow me to sleep because of the great evils I've seen. So let's continue the agitation. Let's continue civil action. Let's join hands and down tools as Christians for a week and submit our constitutional demands to, uh, so to the presidency and to the National Assembly. We as Christians, we no longer feel part of this country. These are the reasons. We therefore demand A, B, C, D to be done. And we continue to escalate the civil disobedience until our demands are met. This is possible. This is doable. We don't have to be violent. We don't have to lift a stone. It has been said that nobody can make you a slave without your tacit complicity in some form. So far, unfortunately, the church has been in tacit complicity. And let me reveal something to you today. These people who are launching atrocities on us, they've understood the church very well. Especially uh, People who are not called, who call themselves prayer contractors, so-called prophets, all these kind of things. Some of them are even into things that you'd be ashamed to call a Christian with regard to them. A sister had a prophecy recently. She had a vision in which the Lord took her to heaven. Wow, heaven was fantastic. Then the Lord took her to her local church. She entered quickly and said, Lord, come in now. Ah, this is my church. No. The Lord started crying. Jesus started crying. My church, my church, my church. It stinks so high. The smell is too much. I cannot enter my house. I cannot enter my church. The smell, the smell is too much. The smell of the church is too much. The Islamists understand that. And they are very contemptible of us. So judgment must begin in the household of faith. Thirdly, we have uh, Sonny Enebi. Afghanistan, if the South moves out, then uh, the Taliban can move in quickly and so on. Well, I don't know. Uh, it's very hypothetical. I don't know what answer to give. But <laughs> I don't know, you know, the, the terrorists are already in control of the North. How many times do you want them to be in control of it? It's just, they're just waiting to decline Islamic State in the North. They had half of Borno at some stage. Eh? So, and uh, even areas where they are not in control, they are already spiritually in control because many of the youths will subscribe to them any day, you know? 
It's just that they've used extremist methods. That is why people are scared. If, if they if they turn the attack a bit, they will, they will be in total control of the North. And uh, in any case, you say if the South pull out, well, um, I am not one of those who still believe that we should break out, break up unilaterally. I think it will be messy. Let us fight for a constitutional restructuring of the country, for a re-engineering of our situation. If we cannot get that, then let, let there be a referendum in which everybody will decide whether to go or to remain in the Nigerian situation. I'm not one of the leaders of the middle belt, but by moral right, I'm seen as a leader of the middle belt. And I can tell you, the middle belt will never stay with the North. I repeat, the middle belt will never stay with the North. If push comes to shove, we are ready to negotiate with the South, South, South East, and the West. If these people, will, because I don't believe any country can survive having two legal systems side by side. It's not going to work. You know? So if, if, if they must have Sharia, then obviously they are telling us that we will not belong because there is no how Sharia is going to treat everybody who is a non-Muslim on an equal footing. And that kind of confusion is not our fate in Jesus' name. So we will now decide, particularly in the middle belt, where we want to belong. We can negotiate and enter into a new association with this, the South, but it will be on the basis of honor and absolute equality, because we've done our sums. The Middle Belt is the largest part of this country. It's the richest in terms of solid minerals and the soil. What the soil can grow. I mean, uh, Bokos, in, one local government in, in, uh, in uh, Plateau State alone can supply the whole of West Africa with potatoes. Many of our solid minerals are totally untapped. We have almost 300,000 square kilometers of land, very lush land. Plateau and Mambila is like Europe. We can grow up and export temperate fruits and all kinds of crops. We have the richest lands in Africa, some of the richest lands in Africa. So we will not join with the North, never in this life, never, 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 never. But we will consider a partnership with the South if there is a possibility in which we are treated as equal members of the, of the partnership and on the basis of honor and absolute equality. That is my stand. But you see, let's give it a try. First, if, if it totally fails, don't forget that the Hausas, the Fulanis are only 5% of Nigeria. And all this Wahala is because of these Fulanis. They constitute the caliphates. They make up 90, 90, 95%, 97% of all the emirs in the North. They control the land. They're a very tiny minority. They brought this extremist wing of Islam. They slaughtered all the Hausa kings. In fact, the, um, the Sun King Zaria, who was a Hausa man, the Hausa people are just, just like you and me. They are also in bondage. They have also suffered. In fact, the reason why you have not heard civil war breaking out now in Nigeria with everything that happened in the Eastern Security Network. They wanted a civil war, but the Salsa people told them, we will never join you. The Middle Belt also told them, we will never join you. You can never send us to go and kill you. They are not our enemies. You cannot send us to go and kill Yorubas. They are not our enemies. You are our enemies. So we will never do your dirty job for you. That is why civil war has not broken. And also we in the Middle Belt who have made it clear to them that they are on their own. 
We joined them in fighting Biafra, believing that we are fighting a genuine civil war to reconcile brothers and to keep the country together. We've made it clear that we will never again do it. So if you notice that confidence, that braggado they used to have, it's, it's gradually fading. And I, I believe that God doesn't make mistakes. It was Albert Einstein, the greatest scientist of the 20th century, who famously noted that God doesn't play dice with the universe, that God is not into a game of chance. He didn't make a mistake in cobbling together all this gaggle of tribes and nationalities into a federation called Nigeria. God was doing a thought experiment to find out whether we would muster the sagacity, the creativity, and the intelligence to create a prosperous, technological, advanced democracy on these shores. Unfortunately, we seem to be failing it. Let's give it a try one more time. And if it doesn't work, then of course, let us think the unthinkable. And then the fourth question was by Ms. Ife Iwa. We've prayed enough, we must take responsibility. I agree with you. I agree with you. Uh, but if you recall what I said, I think you prepared your question before even hearing what I said. I said we must take action. It was only at the tail end of what I said, I said we should also pray. But we've prayed and we've prayed. Now is the time for action. But take even the actions prayerfully. The Lord said pray continually without ceasing. You know, I'm, uh, I, I fellowship online with, uh, uh, you know, you know uh, the monks of uh, Mount Athos in Greece which is probably the oldest Christian holy place, even older than the Vatican. Uh, the monks of Athos, they wake up at, uh, at around three o'clock Greek time, which is around five o'clock Nigerian time. I tried to wake up at that time also and fellowship with them. They have the Jesus prayer that they pray continually. Jesus Christ, son of God, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on me for a sinner. They pray that prayer almost 24 hours, regardless of what they're doing. They'll be mumbling that prayer. It's, it's extremely powerful. So we have to pray continually. Even the battlefields will keep praying, whatever we're doing. So you can never say praying is enough. It's ungodly to say that. Prayer can never be enough. But act. Don't just pray. Act. Because action is part of demonstration of faith in what you're doing. So uh, let's pray without ceasing, but let's also act with faith and act prayerfully. So this is what I would say for now. Thank you so very much indeed. Dr. Obadiah Malafia, please, we want to thank you very, very much for coming to this session today. I'd like to say, say and take uh, liberty and say that we will please invite you back in the nearest future so that we can dig deeper into some of these things and probably give a bit more time on the platform. We have a set of eight questions which I'm going to ask you to please respond to and yes. then you can give your closing remarks and that will be that for All right, doctor, please respond. Thank you very, very much for coming again. We really Thank had you. a very, very outstanding session today. And I Thank will you, call you and arrange for us to meet you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, senior pastor, sir. So oh, let's not over-exaggerate. There are still men and women of God in this country. That is why Nigeria has probably not been destroyed completely because of the remnants. So, uh, but I agree with you. Let's speak truth to ourselves. Let's speak truth to our leaders. And uh, let's continue to encourage them. But please, let's not do it with malice. And let's not do it with bitterness. That is not the godly way. The godly way is to correct people with love, to speak with love, and to speak with humility. I think that is the godly way to do it. And Dev Anyao, why do I think of PIB? The PIB stands for the Petroleum Industry Bill. The spirit under underlying it is okay. 
But I've written about it already in some of my columns. And I said this idea of 30% profit spent in uh, areas for exploration, I think it is very dodgy. Uh, it is very dangerous and it is very wrong. You cannot spend 30% just for exploration, you know? Somebody can just pocket the money and say he has gone to explore in Borno, he has gone to explore in Katsina, and he has not done any exploration. And it, it, can't, it can't be right. I oppose that idea. And the, the mere 3% or so for host communities, I think it is too low. I think it is far, far too low. Uh, it's a more significant amount. I would say up to 7% should go to the host states. But having said that, let me make it very clear that NDDC, for example, is a shameful, corrupt, and fraudulent organization. I'm told that as I'm sitting here now in my obscure corner, if I know somebody there, who can just raise an invoice about a fictitious contract that I've done for them and they will pay me hundreds of millions. So if you can't manage this money from the NDDC fund, how can you manage so much more? Some of the poorest youths have to be found precisely in the petroleum states. Very poor, no job, nothing. And they are getting such humongous amounts of money. How can you justify this? How on earth can you justify this? So much as I oppose this 30% for exploration and the small amount given to the host states, if NDDC is anything to go by, then the host authorities must examine themselves. Let's speak truth to ourselves. Most of the money for NDDC is being wasted, is being stolen. In fact, sometimes I feel, hand over the money to African Development Bank to, uh, they will uh, they will be, in the African Development Bank. And let them come and then manage it, build infrastructures and you know, so on. Take the money away from these people. If you can't manage it, you're stealing everything. Why on earth should we trust you? We could never trust such, such creatures, not at all. So it is, it is very disgraceful and very shameful. I get angry when I speak about this because the managing director was the chairman when he was called for question. A whole professor of medicine, he collapsed and claimed to be fainting. And you are teaching medical students who will operate on other people. And you cannot take responsibility. What kind of human beings are these? Anyway, uh, how do you, the grace Egbagbe, spoke about how do you restructure when I agree, you know, if I without you even finishing this your sentence, I understood precisely what you mean. That most of the majority, many of the legislators come from the north because they gerrymandered the constituencies to give themselves more local governments and more the state. And Lagos with Kano have about the same population, but Kano has doubled the members of the National Assembly and the National Assembly compared to, to Lagos. So obviously they have profiteered from the system and they will not be in a position where you will expect them to dismantle a structure that has served their interest so much. Well, my solution is that there are constitutional moments in the history of nations that require putting aside all the existing institutions and creating a new national assembly in which even the duly elected representative uh, legislators will also be represented there. But let there be a fresh constituent assembly that will deliberate and discuss the idea of a new constitution, frankly, 
openly and sincerely in the interest of our country and in the interest of posterity. That one is doing. It will need a referendum. It will need a new constituent assembly. Some of the existing members could be represented there. They can, out of them, we can choose maybe 10 out of 120 constituent assembly uh, to represent, to be members of it. But let, the, let it be done by a constituent assembly of all the nationalities, representing all the nationalities of our country equally. Uh, and to, uh, how do we pray? No, no, Antonia, uh, yeah, that the church needs to uh, unite and then we need to defend ourselves. Uh, I agree with you that, uh, you know, Christian unity is paramount. And uh, it was Queen Elizabeth I who said, whether Catholic, whether Protestant, there is only one Lord and he's Jesus Christ. If we believe that, then that should be the foundation of Christian uh, unity. And my brother, James Pam, uh, lovely to see you, uh, that I should send a message. My message to Governor Lalong is, please let my people go. You have joined our enemies. You have joined the enemies of our people. Please let our people go. Let our people go. That is all I can say to you. And as for His Excellency Governor Otong, please keep up the great work. God has vindicated you and God will continue to protect you. They hate you so much and they have very evil plans against you. I will continue to pray for you that the Lord will be with you and the Lord will sustain you and sustain your families. Fear not, says the Lord, for I am with thee, and I shall always be with thee, wheresoever thou goest, I shall always be with thee. Uh, Tokwe Longe, well, I'm sorry about the experience you had. I don't know which state you are living in, but it must be one of the far north. If you are living in the far north, uh, it's not easy at all. Uh, my cousin, my nephew, actually, just left KB last week. He went for NYC. He was almost the almost developmental progress. He said that place is not worth living. No human being should be living in that place. Number one, there is no church in the whole town. There's no church at all in the whole town. And the church is not allowed in that town. So he, he managed to, to get himself back for reposting. We came back to Abuja, so we don't know where they were posted uh, this time. Um, well, you have you are entitled to your opinion. I cannot say I challenge your opinion. Sometimes I feel that way, to be honest with you. I go there, I see the way I see things, and I said, my God, how did you join us with this kind of people? Are we ever going to be able to live with them? And the other aspect, too, is that from a pure point of constitutional law, the idea of grand norm, you know, the, the pure theory of law, for those who have studied jurisprudence, the grand norm is the fundamental underlying principle of constitutional government in, a, in, a, in any country. And of course, our grand norm is, is based on the, you know, the common law system. So if we have two grand norms, it's like a snake with two heads. You know, will you run this way, will you run that way? That snake will always be wobbling around in one place. So that is the way it is. So I don't know how we're going to be able to, to do that. But, you know, I, I believe that education matters. Uh, the caliphate system has denied them of education, has made it difficult for them to have that basic understanding that will lead to performance of basic civic duties of citizenship. They only know how to fall down and say Ranka Dede, Ranka Dede will beg him bow for some the crumbs to fall down. They have all this imaginary system. And uh, that is what is taking the north backwards. And today it is the poorest region. It's one of the poorest regions on earth. So, so it's a problem of education. It's a problem of socialization. Uh, it's a problem of education and understanding and enlightenment. So if that is done, you might find that some of them are 
are also human, you know, and they can also be very, very nice people. Believe you. Um, David Okeshola, uh, I agree with you, so I, I wouldn't say anything because I agree with what you said. Thank you. Yinka Olubakin, are we preparing leaders who are just leaders that we, we would mentor? Mentoring is a big problem in the church. It's a big problem generally in Africa, but particularly in the church, we don't really have a good mentoring system. And we need to take not only more interest in politics, we must understand that, you know, as a famous philosopher said, that the only thing required for evil to prevail is for good people to sit back and do nothing. So we, 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 we shy away from, from discussing politics in the church. We must educate our youth. It is part of civic responsibility to be able to educate youth to know not only their rights, but also to understand and appreciate their duties as citizens in a free and democratic society. So we need all that kind of political education in the church. In fact, for our brethren, the Muslims, there's no difference. The, the, the mosque is the most political platform ever. That is where they discuss and plan everything. If they're gonna slaughter people, they plan it in the mosque. If they're gonna vote for whoever, they plan it in the mosque. It is we who have taken this idea of separation of faith and state too far. We've taken it too far. And, uh, you know, I have sometimes feel inspired to go about several churches talking to them about Christian political thought. You know, there are great, uh, you know, like Abraham Kuiper, who was a great Christian, a theologian and a political philosopher. He became prime minister of Holland in the late 19th century, Abraham Kuiper. There were people like Herman Dewey Veard, who was his, uh, his apostle, his student, uh, and, uh, you know, who wrote copiously on Christian social thought and Christian political philosophy. We need these ideas. We need to be better educated and better informed because uh, as Plato said, you know, the price that good people uh, pay for not participating in politics is that they will always be ruled by their inferiors. You don't want to be ruled by your inferiors. So you must participate in politics. You must take interest in politics. And our leaders and elders must learn to mentor young people. Uh, a great medieval Jewish sage by the name of Rabbi Hillel said that great leaders make great followers, but the greatest leaders make leaders of others. So let me stop here. And once again, I really appreciate all of you and I thank our senior pastor, the amiable and uh, very inspiring senior pastor, Itua uh, Ikodalo. And I thank all of you brethren for, for giving me your time and your attention. Uh, the French philosopher Simone Vell said famously that the highest form of compliment is attention. So thank you for your compliment. Thank you for your attention. Um, the Lord bless you mightily. Uh, shalom. Thank you.